Okay, so let's start. <coughs> so first, thank you very much for attending this uh, talk. And uh, in today's talk, we will just talk about a new HDFS feature, the HDFS Eraser Coding. So basically, Eraser Coding is a well-known technology, actually. So in the talk, we just uh, give a very simple overview of the Eraser Coding. We will mainly focus on this kind of how to integrate Eraser Coding into the HDFS. And uh, basically, this is a still this kind of a uh, feature on the development in the community. So engineers from Hortonworks and uh, Caldera, Intel, Huawei, and uh, Yahoo Japan are still actively working on this feature. So in the talk, we will introduce all our uh, something about like uh, our design choices and also some implementation details. We will also introduce uh, the current working progress of this feature in the community and also our next step plan. Uh, so let's, yeah, actually I will try this. Eight, six. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so about the speakers. So basically, Nikos and I are both uh, software engineers at Hortonworks, and uh, we are mainly working on the HDFS. And uh, Nikos is actually a veteran in HDFS. He started working on HDFS since 2007. And uh, he once held the world record of uh, computing those the most uh, number of digits of pi by using Hadoop. Uh, okay, so several years ago when I first started working on HDFS, all, I always had those kind of questions for Nikos because he's the world record holder, right? Then one of the questions is about like uh, this kind of uh, how the HDFS can keep this kind of uh, data reliability. So this is like uh, something like uh, HDFS uh, 101. Then actually, let's revisit uh, this topic here today. So actually, when I prepared this slide, I still made some small mistakes today. And uh, Nikos immediately pointed out. So this is something like uh, we always need to like uh, discuss the details, all those kind of stuff. Then, OK, so we all know the HDFS maintain by default like three replicas for a block. And uh, we place the first replica on the no local node. And if the client actually cannot write in the local node, then we will try the local rack, or finally we just try a random node. Then we set up the writing pipeline. The second and the third replicas will be put on the, on the same remote rack so that we can tolerate those kind of rack failure. So in most of the cases, actually this strategy works pretty well. And uh, so we have uh, this kind of pretty high reliability and uh, we have a uh, good data locality. So the readers have a uh, pretty good chance to read data from a local node. And uh, this uh, replication strategy actually performs very well for this kind of uh, block recovery because imagine we lose uh, the replica R2 or R3 in this, uh, in this example, then we can just uh, pick another replica from the same rack and do this kind of uh, uh, copy and uh, do the recovery. However, when we have more and more data, actually we have this kind of, a, this replication strategy bring us 3x the storage overheads. For example, if we have a, like a very big cluster and we have a massive data sets, let's say tens or hundreds of petabytes of data. And then actually we will spend a lot of money as well on those kind of hard disks. And uh, if I need to like have multiple data centers to support this kind of geo-distributed disaster recovery, and uh, imagine if we still uh, need to keep like uh, three replicas for each block in every data center, actually the cost will just increase a lot. So, here's the alternative, actually the Eurasia coding strategy. So let's give a quick overview of the Eurasia coding technology. So basically for a typical Eurasia coding setup, we usually apply this kind of encoding algorithm to the k data blocks and generate m parity blocks as the redundancy. So we usually call this like a k plus m setup. So in this example, we have like uh, six different data blocks and so we just uh, bind them like as a block group and we just do the encoding. For example, we apply the Ray Solomon algorithm on top of these six data blocks and generate three parity blocks and then we have this kind of nine blocks and we just uh, have this kind of complete uh, block group. And uh, this actually costs like a 1.x storage overhead, right? 
and because only six of them are the real data, and the six are the, as a redundancy. So, but we can, for this, this kind of a urea coding, we have a pretty, we still have a pretty good, this kind of a data reliability, because for this uh, six plus three setup, actually we can tolerate any uh, three failures. For example, I lose uh, block B1, B2, B3, then I just uh, bring in the parity blocks P1, P2, P3, and uh, I collect all the six remaining blocks, do the decoding, and I can just uh, reconstruct B1, B2, B3. But we still have some trade-off here, right? Then the first thing we know, we always need to use those kind of CPU for the decoding, uh, encoding and the decoding. Also, the block reconstruction for the urea coding is very expensive. So in a typical urea coding setup, actually we place all those kind of blocks uh, in those kind of individual racks. Then let's say I lose this kind of block B1. Then I have to copy another six blocks across racks to do this kind of uh, block reconstruction. And this actual traffic is actually all, uh, because it's uh, across the racks, so they can overburden those kind of uh, proper rack switch and the rotor. And uh, so actually as an improvement uh, during this uh, recent several years, people have developed uh, different uh, this kind of uh, uh, coding algorithm like uh, LRC and also in Facebook they have this kind of new system called uh, Hitchhiker also have some novel uh, coding algorithm. So in HDFS, you really coding actually, we also have this kind of plan to adopt these algorithms. So the, some jitters have already been uh, created and uh, some initial patch already been posted. So let's talk about how to integrate the Eurera coding into HDFS. So basically the most uh, straightforward this kind of strategy is something like uh, we directly apply the Eurera coding on those existing contiguous blocks. So let's say we have three files and uh, they have uh, then in total we have these kind of six blocks. So we just uh, bind all these six blocks together as a block group and apply the encoding algorithm, generate three parity blocks. And finally we just associate these three parity blocks with all these data blocks. Then actually this has been done several years before in those kind of HDFS read work. And uh, basically you need to set up some uh, separate daemon or service do this kind of offline scanning and uh, this kind of encoding. Then the second option, we just uh, do this kind of uh, user coding on the striped blocks. And so for this kind of striping basically we can support Eurea coding online, which means while you're writing the data, I directly do the Eurea coding. So this picture shows the example. So let's say the writer just uh, write data like uh, chunks by chunks. And uh, the sequence of this kind of writing is something like, uh, I first write a chunk C1. Each chunk typically is like uh, 64 KB, but you can just uh, tune it. And I first write the chunk C1, then I write chunk C2 and then C3. So this is the writing sequence. So before actually we usually like uh, write C1, C2, C3 into the uh, same uh, data block, right? But here with striping actually we will just uh, separate them into different uh, data blocks. So C1 will be written into the first data block B1 and B1 will go to a data node. And C2 will be written into B2 and B2 will go to a data, another data node. And until C6 actually we finish a stripe. And uh, after finish writing this uh, stripe, the first stripe, then we do the encoding on the whole stripe and generate three parity chunks, PC1, PC2, and PC3. And these three parity chunks will be also be distributed into three different uh, parity blocks and they will be stored in three different data nodes. And then we just uh, continue, write the second stripe and do the encoding, then the third stripe and so on. So basically the, the advantage of this is like uh, now even if the, the size of the file, let's say is small, let's say just like uh, 10 megabytes, I can still evenly use this strategy, I can still evenly distribute the data into like uh, multiple data blocks and do this kind of encoding, generate the parity blocks, so enable this kind of evaluate coding. Uh, and also because we can imagine all these kind of chunks can actually can be written in parallel, right? Because C1, C2 until C6, they are just uh, sent to different data nodes. So actually we can leverage multiple these kind of uh, uh, data nodes and uh, 
then we can just, in theoretically, actually, we can achieve very good writing performance. Okay, but <coughs> for the reading part, actually, we lose the data locality. So a reader has to like uh, contact uh, at least uh, six data nodes, then just to read like a uh, stripe by stripe and uh, reconstruct the whole data. And also, usually like uh, this is striping strategy is good, usually better for those kind of big files. Let's say I only have a small file, like 10 megabytes of data. And originally I only need to write the data into a single block. So which means uh, that I only need to like uh, put uh, one entry, actually three entries in those kind of, uh, because three replicas, right? So in those kind of block reports. And the data uh, on the name node side, it only needs to like uh, maintain one record for this block as those kind of block management. But now these 10 megabytes will be distributed into six different uh, data blocks. And we also generate another three parity blocks. So which means this actually can, this striping strategy can generate uh, a lot more blocks in the cluster and also brings extra burden to the name node, especially considering name node is actually has to like uh, cost those kind of memory to store the state of the blocks. Okay, so currently in HDFS Eurasia coding, we decided like uh, first to do the striping plus Eurasia coding because we think like we can like support more use cases and also this kind of code change can be na more naturally fit into the current uh, the block manager, those kind of code. And uh, but uh, in the second phase, we will just uh, support Eurasia coding on the contiguous blocks. So this is a very straightforward architecture. So basically we need to change everything in HDFS to support the uh, Eurasia coding. On the name node side, we need to support these striped blocks. And also name node need to learn how to schedule this kind of block reconstruction. Then on the data, uh, on the client side, we need to like uh, do also support the stripe blocks and uh, do the encoding on the writing part and uh, do the decoding on the reading part. Then on the data node side, the data node need to understand this kind of block reconstruction command sent from the name node and collect all the data blocks and the parity blocks from other data nodes and do those kind of block reconstruction. So let's first talk about the name node side chain. So basically, we just bring in a new concept called the uh, Eurasia coding zone into the picture. And uh, this Eurasia coding zone is simply just a directory. So the administrator can just uh, uh, use this kind of a create zone command to convert an empty directory into a Eurasia coding zone. Then later, all the new files on, uh, created uh, under this Eurasia coding zone directory will be automatically uh, Eurasia coded. And uh, we don't allow this kind of uh, moving or say renaming across Eurasia, two different Eurasia coding zones with different uh, uh, Eurasia coding schemas. So as a first stage actually to support this kind of a conversion between the uh, non-EC code to EC code or from one EC schema to another EC schema, we have to do those kind of a DCP similar to this kind of copy. So another big change in the name node side is to support the striped blocks. And uh, one big change here, as we just mentioned before, so we need to like uh, learn how to lower the memory cost because for usually like uh, for example like 10 megabytes we still need to create like a nine blocks in the cluster, right? And name node, uh, currently name node just uh, use one record in the blocks map to capture the state and the location of a block. So which means in that case for 10 megabytes, even just the file is small like 10 megabytes, I still need to have like uh, nine records in the blocks map to track all the state of these kind of uh, six data blocks and uh, three parity blocks. That's a lot of memory cost. So we do some, we have done some optimization here. So the idea is very simple. So in the name nodes on the, in the blocks map, I still use one single record to track the whole striped block group. So for on the data node side, data node did then they need to understand that this kind of optimization. So it will still send the block reports about all those kind of uh, uh, data block uh, and uh, parity block. 
But after the name node receiving this block report, it will just uh, mask the last four digits of the block, uh, the, the ID of the correspond corresponding block, and map all the reported block to the corresponding block group record in the blocks map, and just uh, uh, update the internal state of the block group. So in this way, actually, we can save a lot of memory. And so far, actually, we covered all the changes on the, most of the changes in the name node set. So in the next part, Nicholas will just introduce the writing and the reading semantic. Right, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, I will continue with talking about the writing sem semantic, and then I will talk about the read part, and then I will describe the current development, and the scope of our project, and also uh, the 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 related Jira. And I I have I also have a few uh, backup slide. If we still have time, I can talk about the comparison between uh, free replication with uh, six D read development. And I also have one last slide is talking about the math behind uh, erasure coding. Uh, yeah, he, let's, uh, before we uh, talk about erasure code, let's review the current white pipeline for replicated file. So uh, when we write to a file, we will create a white pipeline, a data pipeline. So in the diagram below, you can see there's a writer, and then uh, the client actually will ask the lamp node to RK, uh, block location for the for the block, and then usually you set a replication fee, and then the LAN node will return free uh, data location to the client. And then what client will do is the client will create a pipeline, it will write data to the first data node, and then the first data node will forward the data to the second data node, and the second data node forward the data to the last data node. And, and once the last data node receives the data, it will uh, send an act back to the second data node, and so on. Uh, looks that uh, this is a pipeline, so the waiter it won't wait for the act before it continues sending new, new data. It will keep sending new data until the buffer is full. So, so uh, uh, it won't wait for the act un unless there's a, a other special operation, for example, the hpush or close the file. And the durability guarantee is provided by the replication. So we have few replicas, so we can lose two of them, then we can still copy the data. We can still read the data. And one very important feature for the, our white pipeline is that we support readability guarantee. So uh, reader can read uh, being written file. So even the file is not closed, you can read it, and you can use extra to make the reader uh, make the data readable. And and also uh, we support consistency. Reader can read from any of any replica, and then it can fail over to the, to any other replica to read the same data. Uh, for HDF file, we also support append, so you can close the file and then you can append it later. So we want to do something similar for erasure code file. Uh, I also want to uh, describe the HFUD and exchange semantic in HDFS because uh, sometimes people are not very really keen about that. So first of all, let's talk about Java fudge or C, C++ uh, F fudge. So fudge means that we want to fudge the uh, buffer the output to the to, to be written now, to be underlying device. For example, you can fudge it to the library or fudge it to the hard drive. So this is uh, fudge. And what H fudge means? In HDFS, because we are talking about distributed computing, we are a multiple machine. So when you say I fudge out to the library, it does not mean anything because you fudge, because we have a pipeline, you fudge out to the library, the data may only be available in the first data node it may not be available for in other data node. So H first uh, guarantee that after you refresh, you will, all the free data node will get the data. Uh, because this is only fudge, the data may be still in memory. Let's say you cut the power at, the, at that time, then you lose your data. And uh, H first is for you, for you what, what, what to do is for, you want to, the writer can do H first, then all the data before H first will be available for the reader. And in, the, in addition to H first, we have H sync, Xsync is uh, Xfus plus uh, do a local file system sync. So because sometimes you not only want the data in the memory, you want to, it to be persistent. And you, you, try, you try to do it by uh, sync, a local file system sync. 
And when hsync return, it means that this, all the three data nodes have done sync complete. And hsync also have an option for you to update the length in the lamp node. Uh, in HDFS, when you write a file, uh, the length won't report to the lamp node because it's too much overhead. You to uh, report every time there's a lot of overhead. However, you can use exchange to update the link. So this is very useful uh, for some application. For example, uh, if you want to take snapshot, uh, uh, before you take a snapshot, you, there may be some file is being written, and and you don't want to close the file. You don't want to. You just want to take a snapshot at that time, and you want to make sure that a particular link is visible in the snapshot. Then you want to do exchange with uh, update link. And let's talk about uh, UHL code file. How do we do? So UHL code file, we don't have white pipeline uh, because uh, we have nine different uh, block. Uh, is the data different? You cannot do it in a pipeline. So what we, what we will do is a, a parallel write. So the kind we write to a group of nine data nodes at the same time, just like in this uh, diagram. And you can see that you just write the data and then get the app. Uh, the durability guarantee is provided by uh, six feet resolution. So uh, six feet resolution can uh, tolerate maximum fee failure. And for the reusability guarantee, we will provide the same guarantee as uh, before. So we will reader is able to support, is able to read the being written file, and also data will be visible by H4 and H thing. For the consistency, uh, reader now need to read six any six of the nine data nodes. And when uh, when one of the one of the data fail, it can fail off to any other data node and to read the same data. I will give more detail for the readers part later. Uh, so the last part is the append. We also support append, just like replicate the file. And how to handle data failure? So uh, let's say you are writing some data, and you get some app, and let's say one of them is fail. So what happened in our implementation, we are going to ignore the failure because we can tolerate fee failure. So let's say there's one failure, we just ignore it. And as long as we have uh, six data nodes available, because once uh, if you have six data nodes, we can recover uh, the other block later. So the missing block will be reconstructed uh, for uh, later when the block is closed. So this uh, is very similar to replication before. Uh, in the old time replication, when we do replication in the white pipeline, when we lose data node, we won't add new data node back. We will just continue until there's no more data node. So this uh, is very similar. And for replication, uh, because we want to support something called slow writer. So there's some application, they create a file, and then they write slowly. How slow? They can write for days or weeks, something like that. They, they write a few bytes at a time, and then just sleep or wait, and then they write sometime later. And we want to support this kind of application and however because the white pipeline lasts for a long time and the probability of failure become high you, you say the white pipeline lasts for a few days and you may get three days of failure and what happened is that we want to uh, support this case is uh, let's say there's a data failure we will uh, remove the data from the white pipeline and at the same time we will add back a new data node to the white pipeline in this diagram the data node two failure and we add back data node four to the white pipeline And this feature, we call it replace data on failure. And for easy file, because I, we think that we believe that this is not a use case for easy file. Easy file usually is for uh, large file and also uh, is for cold data. So for if you want to do slow writer, let's just use a replicated file, it's good enough. So we won't optimize this for the easy file for slow writer. And now I'm going to talk about how to read the file. And for read, we are similarly, we are doing parallel read. So um, we, we we write to six uh, data node. I mean, uh, six data block to data node and three parity block. And the reader will choose the data block to read, and you read all the six block in parallel. And we will support a stateful read and also position read. St stateful read means that you just open the input stream from the file system, and then you keep reading it. And the stream will remember the state, the position you're reading, and then you, when you say read again, you give the next uh, available data. And position read uh, is something we, every time when you read the file, you you, you specify the position and so the length you want to read, and then the API will return you the data. And what happened for uh, 
if there's some data is not available, let's say now you you still have six uh, data block, and let's say data block fee is not available, so the block fee is not available. You cannot read block fee. So what what happens is that you will, the uh, the reader will read from one priority block uh, DN seven, and you will read uh, block one two four five six from the data. Uh, data block one five one two four five six and also priority block one, and the reader will be will use the uh, algorithm to reconstruct uh, block fee uh, locally. And how do we handle failure? Failure handle, handling is um, uh, similar to reading missing block. So let's say we have uh, we, we we at some point we reading some from block one block three block five block six and priority one and priority two. And let's say one of the data fail, let's say uh, data uh, five fail, and you cannot read block five anymore. Then, uh, then what happened? The reader is, is going to find the remaining party block, and then we read the party block. And, and in this case, we need to reconstruct free block, because we, already, uh, we don't have free data block. So we are going to reconstruct block two, block four, and block five. And let's talk about the UHR coding phase one. So uh, phase one, uh, so this is the basic feature of UHR coding. So what we are going to do is we're going to support a single schema, the six feet read Solomon. And for waiting to easy file, we will, we will, in case there's failure, we will just ignore the failure and continue. And then we will continue waiting as long as there are six data nodes. And in the first phase, we are not going to support sync and hpush. And we also are not going to support append and truncate. And for reading part, we support, uh, of course, we support reading from closer file. And for reading, uh, we also support reading on open uh, on being written file. Uh, however, uh, because we don't have H front and H when you read from being written file, you only can read to up to the last closer uh, block group. And for reading, we also we, we, we handle failure. We reconstruct the block if there's a failure. And we also support uh, block reconstruction. So block reconstruction is very similar to replication monitor. So it will be scheduled by the land node, and then the data will do the work. And there's a lot of land node change, uh, just as uh, Jane mentioned. Um, we all we will support uh, UHR code zone, and we also will support uh, strike block group. And we will we, we'll change uh, some tools like FSCK to show uh, the EC block information. So you can verify whether your block uh, is missing or, or, or you, can, you, can, you can know the detail of the block. And for file conversion, so we support uh, online writing. Uh, online encoding means that when you create a file, you can specify that this is erasure code file, and then you directly write to erasure code format. And for file conversion, we 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 are going to support is that you use DCP to copy the file from replicated file to UHU file or the other way. So the feature development uh, is uh, the main gear is uh, 7285 HDFS, and we have a lot of subtasks. We have something like 168 subtasks, and we already finished uh, 137 subtasks. And we also have common side chains because we want to support a general EHR code, uh, code app. And there are lots of uh, contributors in this project. Uh, you can see the list is very long. And uh, the contributors from uh, Hortonworks, uh, Yahoo Japan, uh, Intel, Caldera, and also Huawei. And I also want to talk about some future works. So, uh, we have some four on works. Uh, for example, we want to support H part and thing because before we are saying that this is uh, production ready, and we also want to support append and chunk. So these are what very important use case for us. And with H part and X thing, we will support a reading being written file. So we can do H part, and then the reader is able to see the data up to the H part position. We we also want to support uh, more schema as uh, uh, Jane mentioned. Uh, uh, later, we, are, we will support a contextual layout. For, uh, what, uh, in the beginning, we will just support stripe layout. And I, uh, yeah, later, we will support contextual layout. And with contextual layout, we can combine small file, and then we can encode this multiple file together. And there's a, a few Jira for the future development. So uh, thank you.
uh, look like we still have some time, so I'm going to use my backup slide. Um, so first, let's uh, compare a few applications with uh, 6 v with Solomon. And the two very important aspects is that the fault uh, tolerance. So for free web application, you only sub can tolerate two failure. And, but for 6 v with Solomon, you can sub uh, tolerate three failure. And also, the, the second very important feature of uh, UHL code is the disk space usage. So for n byte of data, uh, you, for few applications, you, you need to use the n uh, storage space, and this is something like 200% overhead. And for 6 v visual man, because we are using Stripe layout, and even for very small file, we only need 1.5 uh, uh, n uh, for storing the file, so the overhead is only 50%. And we have more any, uh, we, have, we also have other schema. For example, we can do 10 for with Solomon. And if we do that, we can even get a lower overhead. And there are also a uh, problem of the erasure code. So for example, one problem is the lamp space usage. So lamp space usage for replication is very simple. So for every block, you need uh, one block uh, record in the LAM node and also three location record in the LAM node. And for two block, you, you just time two, uh, two, two block record and six location record. And for any number, you just uh, multiply it. And if we do six v with Solomon naively, then we need nine block record and nine, block, nine location because uh, we have six data block and three priority block. And just Jane mentioned, uh, we can do some optimization so we can combine the line block record to a one block good rec record. So, and so that we can use one block good plus uh, nine location. How do we do the optimization? First of all, uh, we, we can use consecutive block IDs for the block group. And then we only store the first block ID. And for the other block ID, we just use the index of the uh, block and then we can determine the rest of the block ID. And for generation stem, we make sure that all the nine blocks share the same uh, generation stem. Then we only store one copy in the LAM node. And for the size, we can only store the total size. And then we can deduce the, the individual uh, block size. And here is more um, comparison. Uh, so we compare the number of blocks required to read the data. So for web application, it's very simple. If you want to read one block, you need to access one block. And you need to read three blocks, and you need to access three blocks. But for visual man, uh, if you, even you want to read one block, you need to access six blocks before you can read one block. And, and yeah. And as, so if you want to read from one to six blocks, then you, 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 you get access six blocks. And one thing uh, maybe important is the number of kind data node connection. So because when we do a erasure code, and we are going to write in parallel and read in parallel. Parallel is something good. Uh, you can write faster, or you can read faster. However, they also need more connection. So um, for web application, because we are using white pipeline, so even you write to free replica, you only need one data node connection to the client. And for read, you read from one, web, one of the replica, so you read only need one connection. But for, which, uh, for UHL code, you need uh, nine connections for write and six connections for read. And it may be a problem for some applications. They open a lot of files at the same time. And let's also go through the last slide, the math behind. So we have a very beautiful theorem telling you that for given any n points, it can determine a unique polynomial with degree d is where d is less than or equal to n minus 1. So what do we use this theorem to do erasure code is that, first of all, we consider the six uh, data box to be data point in the, in the xy plane. So we, for example, block i, the i is the x coordinate, and then the data in the block is, is the y coordinate. Then we compute the unique uh, polynomial, uh, unique degree five polynomial passing these six points. Then you get a polynomial. And once we have the polynomial, we can compute the priority. So we put j, for j is equal to seven, eight, and nine, and then we compute the corresponding value with the polynomial, and then we get the priority. And now what happens is that you have nine points lying in a, the same polynomial with degree less than or equal to five, which means that any six of these nine points can recover the same polynomial. 
that's why the how the erasure code can do the recovery. So uh, that's all for my for our presentation. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Oh, um, uh, I we plan to actually we are working on merging. Um, right now we are have a feature branch, so we are getting merging the branch to chunk. I think what I June, I think probably in August or or sometime around that we we will get the merge to chunk. However, mer merging to chunk is not something uh, production ready or something we can release. And I guess we can release by the end of the year. Yeah, it's production ready. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, oh, by the way, please come to the microphone. I forgot. <laughs> Have you done any measurements on the impact of rebuilds on CPU and network bandwidth? Uh, I think, so uh, yeah, actually, yeah, recently we have done the uh, thing. Yeah, so, yeah, actually the country, we already created several years for that, and uh, actually uh, Yahoo Japan engineers are currently working on this performance benchmark in their cluster. So I think they will post some results uh, like uh, maybe this month. Uh, I can actually give you the GR number, so <laughs> it's HDFS 8198. Yes. <laughs> yeah. One of the advantage of the replication is that simplicity of the usage. You can use the data directly without any recording. So how does this affect uh, MapReduce, for example? Oh, uh, actually, for erasure code, especially in the beginning, we don't recommend uh, you encode your file, and then you, we only recommend when you erasure your, your, the code data of file. We don't recommend you use a erasure file for for running job or something like that. Because as Jane mentioned, you lose data locality. Mm -hmm. So your job is not going to be efficient. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the block groups. I don't know enough about the HDFS internals, but um, does the data node location, so you, then you, you use like um, optimization, they're all continuous numbers. If one of the data nodes would be offline for uh, a long time, can you like replicate that oh, part somewhere oh, else, oh, or does oh. it have to be the same <laughs> physical location? Oh, uh, so the container is the block ID, not the data node address. So, the, so, we was, so in the optimization, what we do is we only optimize the block, but the location we cannot optimize. We still need to store line location. So we can combine the nine block together. For example, the block ID, we use consecutive block ID. But the location, we cannot. We just uh, store nine different locations. And let's say some data is done, then we will have eight locations. Then, uh, yeah. So, so the general idea is like uh, before the optimization, we have to like uh, store nine different records in the name node set. The key of the record is like a block ID or block object. The value can be something like a location of the block, those kind of replicas, right? Uh, that's the data node. So basically, this means like we have like nine different records for even a small file because we distribute them into in the striping layout. Now we actually still just kill one record in the name node side. And this name node side, actually the block side, the block, the key actually, we just use this kind of uh, the first key of the uh, six data blocks, uh, the first ID of the six blocks because the ID is actually the, like uh, consecutive. And then the, the value actually we still track all the nine corresponding those kind of data nodes. So the location is still there. So if you lose one of the blocks, you can re replicate it somewhere else. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. We can then you update the location. Mm. Two related questions. Um, do you have any technology to protect against dropped writes or silent data corruption by the disk, like checksums or version numbers? And then the, se the related question is, you talked a lot about losing a whole data node or a whole disk. What do you do when you have an individual media error on one sector? Yes, so basically, because on the data node side, we still have the exact the same mechanism, just like the replication strategy. Because actually this erasure coding and the replication strategy is totally transparent to the data node. So they still keep all the checksum for all the data written to the disk. So in that way, actually, everything works exactly the same as the replication strategy. So with the checksum, we immediately find this kind of corruption. And so the data node will report to the name node. 
all this kind of corruption can even be detected by the writer because if the data is still being written and immediately detected this kind of corruption, right? And uh, also the, because data node keep doing this kind of scanning, right? And also, so the corruption can be immediately detected based on this kind of checksum. And then of course this kind of block, no matter, doesn't matter it's a parity block or data block will be declared as a corrupted and so the name node will schedule this kind of corruption. And how about a one sector media error? Uh, one sector, so you mean like uh, on the disk and uh, just uh, one sector just uh, On the read you get a SCSI CDB, a SCSI sense data that says media error. So I think uh, basically we don't need to like uh, totally go to the, this kind of uh, lower level to, to handle, right? But basically this kind of failure means like uh, only means like uh, either, okay, so I declare this kind of volume failed or I declare this kind of a data corrupted. Then actually this is the same as just using the existing strategy. Uh, kind of a question around some of the performance things. I know you guys are talking about the Stripe, doing the Stripe blocks. Uh, one, are you expecting any sort of impact from additional seeks? And also, is that part of you guys' like testing plan that'll be part of the JIRA? just kind of like results from like, if there's any performance impact from uh, yeah. striping. So the six, I guess you, are, you mentioned is like uh, in a state for read, I just uh, seek, then I just uh, read. For a while, then I seek to another position, I continue reading, right? Right, right, obviously with right, the stripe right. side, you're gonna be doing a lot more, small, right, lot more exactly. seeking, so which that'll impact throughput. So the first thing is like, uh, even currently with the replication strategy, I would say the seek, then read, the performance is actually not good. So because this is because like uh, our current uh, this kind of a uh, data transfer protocol between name node and data node, actually we don't have this kind of uh, framed this kind of uh, design. So basically you just uh, start this kind of protocol, send out the metadata about like uh, which block I want to read and from wh which position I want to read, then just continue reading. Then if you do the seek again, actually uh, usually if, of course we have those kind of low level buffer, which is like a 64 KB, this kind of packet size. If I just uh, like reading the, the range is beyond this kind of uh, size, then okay, I need to close this reader and uh, re just uh, the, uh, uh, open this some connection and uh, start reading. So for the Eurera coding country, we may have like uh, some similar issue because, because for reading each chunk, we still reuse the kind of re uh, data transfer protocol, right? So which means of, of course, we still have this kind of buffer, but the buffer size now currently is like uh, on the reader side is like a 64 KB times six. It's uh, like a whole stripe. But if you're reading and uh, you seek actually totally beyond this kind of stripe, and uh, then the reader, the, 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 the block reader has to be reconstructed to, to, to like uh, tell the corresponding data node saying like, uh, you need to move this kind of uh, uh, position to another uh, position on your local file. And to ac actually overcome this, we need to redesign the, this kind of data transfer protocol, and which is actually already in progress in the community. Because okay. we have this kind of plan to use this kind of adopted as uh, uh, HTTP2 or this kind of new protocol to just uh, rewrite this kind of data transfer protocol. And, uh, but I don't remember the tier number <laughs> for this one. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. But I can send you this corresponding information afterwards. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, for the failure scenario uh, in the chart that you showed. The reconstruction happens when the last, uh, you know, when you must have to rebuild the data. So uh, if you don't read the data, you yeah. would never know that you know you need yeah. to rebuild. So what is the provision to make sure you always have enough copy to be able to serve the data when reader needs it? Oh, uh, so the so this is similar to replication. So mm -hmm. what we do is uh, the data node report the box to the land node periodi periodically. So the land node have the information which data node have which block. And then when someone wants to read the file, the land node will return the location. The land node also will monitor the number of copies the, 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 the block in the data node. If you say the missing block, then you try to replicate it in, in case of replication. In case of uh, USR code, we will reconstruct the block. So let's say there's some missing block, then we will reconstruct it. And when the reader open the file, uh, we will return the location. Yeah. Okay, so it would be more of a like uh, how it does today, rebalancing and reconstruction. Um, uh, it's, 
for the reconstruction is very similar to replication. So uh, rebalancing is a different thing. Rebalancing is for, for uh, moving the box around to, so that the cluster become balanced. Right. So replication is to copy the replica so that it maintain the in, enough number of replica. And for GC erasure code, we, we have something very similar to replication monitor. You will monitor the number of uh, box inside a box group, and if there's a lot enough, uh, there's, if there's some missing block, we will reconstruct it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the second question is in the, the parity calculation, is that happening on the data node um, or on the writer side when? Oh, uh, for parity calculation, it's happening for, white, for online writing, it's happening in the writer side. The writer will calculate right, the parity right. and then send to the data node. Data, actually, the data don't know whether this is a parity block or a data block. Uh, they don't, don't have this information. Well, the data, okay, so from a resource management point of view, it is the data node actually would be writing as well. The application is probably running on the data node, so there would be some compute overhead. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. You, you, you have some compute, file. you have some uh, CPU overhead uh, when we writing US code file, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I'm fairly new at this, so I apologize for the dumb question, but I think I heard earlier that MapReduce is not really a good workload for this type of storage model. Do you have some uh, key use cases or key types of workloads where this works really well or is sufficiently good? Oh, uh, actually, Eurasia code is for uh, reducing space usage. So it's for code data. It's for some data that you, you don't foresee you use. And just, but however, if you cannot delete the data, you have to keep it in the system. Then we, you want to erase your code. Okay, so as opposed to delete and yeah, keeping yeah. it just in case mm -hmm. is to move it off. But yes. if I really decide to do any kind of processing, I really got to bring it back out of your erasure zone. Uh, yes, if the data become hot, then you have to. So we support we think using map reduce to read erasure code file. However, it's not going to, not efficient. So if you, you foresee that the d data become hot again, then you, you should copy the data back, move, move it out to erasure code zone. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But generally, that depends on whether the data locality is still very important to you. So for example, in some clusters, for example, I, I heard from some friends, like uh, they're saying like in Google, for example, in their setup, they are just uh, like uh, maybe 100% of the data are just uh, user coded. So basically, maybe they have this kind of very strong, this kind of network setup, and uh, they don't care too much about the data locality. And in that case, actually, you can choose your coding and uh, and you just uh, don't care data locality. Right? And I just wanted to understand as well. So what I think I heard was to take advantage of Erasure, I would take a file that I currently have, regular HDFS storage model. I would, I would define this other zone, which is like another path. And I would copy that file from one path to another file mm -hmm. or move it. Mm -hmm. is, copy, is copy. Copy, not, not move? Yeah, not move. Not move. Not move. Uh, so it's currently, you don't support move. Later, okay. maybe you may support move. So a copy, and then, mm -hmm. so would that be supported for an entire directory tree of files? Like if I had a, yes, a yes, lot of directories, a lot of right, files. Right, right. Because we already have a tool called DCP, so DCP can let you distribute the copying the entire tree to one location, from one location to another location. Okay, mm -hmm. great, thank you. Okay, oh, uh, oh okay, this uh, maybe. Oh, maybe we can just. Uh, last question, yeah. <laughs> uh, what happens when a file has less than the number of bytes you need to calculate a parity? So let's say there's it's like four four bytes or three bytes. You mean the file uh, is really small? Yeah. Like a less yeah. than a chunk. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So actually, we still are like a computer, the three parity blocks, and uh, basically the size of the parity chunks is even like uh, the exact the same with the the because you you don't have like uh, you cannot even fill the first chunk, right? The parity size were actually exactly the, with the uh, the same with the, the first chunk size. So like uh, you write four bytes, then you will have another three parity blocks, yeah. and each parity block actually the size is four bytes. Yeah, this is the case that we don't get 1.5. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, 1.5. Right, right, right. <laughs> <So laughs> right, right, right. exactly. You get four times over it. <laughs> 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 That's a lot. Yeah, thank you.